You know how some people in your hood, yo, he could drink two 40 ounces. You know, and we it's mm -hmm. crazy how we celebrate not healthy behavior. And I'm saying, oh, DMC, Daryl can drink two 40 ounces. No, I was drinking a case. Wow. Mm. I didn't, but I didn't see anything wrong with that. And that's in addition, I'm drinking a case. That's during the daytime, a case all day. Then you go out, at, out, at, out you go out at night to the clubs and it's Bacardi and Coke and rum and Coke and vodka. Like, you know, it was crazy for me. A lot so, of so cocaine. Huh? No, I'm sorry. I thought you were finished. Go ahead, sir. All right. Yeah, let me finish real quick because it, it's a lot. So that's, I was doing this behavior. But since it's celebrated and normalized in the community, I wasn't able to see that there was a deeper problem. So here's the crazy thing. That's from, I would say, 89 to 90. In 1991, I'm diagnosed with acute pancreatitis. I almost died from drinking a case of 40s in Bacardi and Coke and vodka day. So now I end up in the hospital for a month and a half. And I couldn't take nothing orally. I had to get everything to the vein. So I'm in a hospital for a month and a half. And something should have told me something was going on. Because when I got admitted to the hospital, the doctor looked at me and said, son, how, how much do you drink? How many cans of beer do you drink a day? And I'm like, uh, I don't drink cans of beer. I drink 40 ounces. Okay, how many 40s a, a week you drink? Two or three? I said, no, I drink a case a day. They was like, yo, admit this guy right here. Like, Put him, tape his mouth shut so he don't put <laughs> nothing back like it was bad. So long story short, I'm in a hospital for a month and a half. When I got released from the hospital in 91, the doctor said, son, you have two choices in life. You could drink and die. I'll never forget him say that. Or you cannot drink and live. So from 91 to 93, it was all good. It was smooth. But now this Down With The King record, now we're back at the Down With The King record comes out. So mm -hmm. now everything I've been through for, since 1983 with Run DMC is about to happen again. Touring, money, peer pressure, you know, just, just, just the pitfalls of the music business. Subconsciously, I never really paid attention to all of that, my emotions and feelings, because I was too busy getting drunk and high not to deal with those feelings. So I guess what had happened when this Down With The King record came about, all of these emotions started bubbling to the top. So I still didn't know what was going on. So from 93 to like 96, um, 96, 93 to 96 comes, I'm not wanting to deal, deal with this feeling anymore. I didn't know where, first of all, I didn't know where to go, what to do. I didn't know it was okay. I didn't know it was cool to ask for help. Um, I didn't know there was places I could go to ask for help. You're busy thinking, I don't want nobody to know I'm going through anything because I'm so worried about how people want to think about me when my health and my well-being is the most important thing ever. Now I know F everybody. But back then, I had this guilt and shame with having these emotions and feelings and weaknesses. So I didn't know what to do. So the killer is, it was like 96 when I couldn't live with the feeling no more. Like, you got to imagine, from 93... 94, 95, now four years of no solution. So now, F it. I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to jump. I'm going to go to the roof and jump. But this is funny. Before I was going to go do that, I said to myself, Daryl, if you die tomorrow, people are going to know the Red DMC stuff because you've been all on the front page in magazines. You're in the history books. But nobody knows who Daryl is. They know what Run DMC did. They know what uh, Run, DMC, and Jam Master J did. But they don't know about the little boy, Daryl, the person, Daryl, who made all of this possible. So I said, just in case I do die tomorrow, before I go, I want to write a book. And this was the first book that I wrote. And just for that book, I wanted to go, yo, what's up, world? I'm DMC. You know me from the groundbreaking rap group, Run DMC. First to go gold, first to go platinum. First on the cover of Rolling Stone, first with the sneaker deals, first with the big tours and all of that stuff. But then I was like, I'm really just Daryl McDaniels, no different from any other little boy or girl in the world. I was born May 31st, 1964. And when I got to that part about my identity, I was like, oh, I know my birthday, but I don't know no details about it. So here's the killer. I call my mother up. I didn't say, mom, 
just in case I die tomorrow, I want to write this book. And she would have lost it. I said, Mom, I'm writing a book. And just to make it more interesting for the reader, I want to know three things about the day I was born. How much did I weigh? What time I was born? What hospital? So she tells me that. I love you, son. I love you, too. I hang up the phone. An hour goes by. She calls back with my father. Hey, son. Hey, dad. What's up? They go, we have something else to tell you. And I'm like, okay, what? Now, at that point, I'm suicidal. I'm emotional. I'm in the most vulnerable state ever. Um, I don't care about anything except getting rid of this feeling in me. So I'm already the worst place that a person could possibly be, be in. They hit me with this. Well, we have something else to tell you. So I'm thinking they're going to go, well, when you was born, there was a power outage in the hospital and we gave birth to you by candlelight or something like that. Or there was an earthquake when you was born. No, they hit me with this. You was a month old when we brought you home and you're adopted, but we love you by click. So imagine that. Imagine I'm all. So right then and there, it was over. Now, my whole existence exploded. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know about therapy. I didn't know about getting help. I didn't know any phone. And I'm the mighty DMC, the king of rock. And I still was helpless. So the only thing that I knew after being not necessarily cold turkey from 90, I had acute pancreatitis. I, if I drink, I die. All of that went out the window. When I found out the revelation that I was adopted, I didn't know where to go, what to do. I said, I'm starting to drink. Now, by me picking up enough a drink after having pink, acute pancreatitis, the doctor said, if you drink, you die. I started to commit suicide in a way that subconsciously, I ain't got to pull a trigger. I ain't got to hang myself. I ain't got, let me just go do the thing that I'm not supposed to be doing that's going to kill me. So I don't have to deal with these emotions. So it was 93. It was behavior and situations prior to that. It's me going cold turkey. And then me, the revelation of me finding out that I was adopted was the thing that is going to make me kill myself. Because now I'm nothing if I'm not Daryl from Hollis. Now, tell so, me this. How old were you at that time? I was 35 years old. So you found out at the age of 35 that I was adopted and it was a secret. Out. And er the funny thing is all of my family cousins knew my whole neighborhood knew the block knew my teachers knew. And it was, don't let keep it a secret. Don't now I understand why they did it because they love me, but by treating me different to make me feel the same about something that's different to me, that would make me feel normal. You're ruining everything. So now I got to deal with that. That all, all of y'all, y'all, like, imagine how hurt I was. I, I get this traumatic revelation. Now, it wasn't about my mother and father. They were great. I had a great life. Y'all know Christmas in Hollis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Christmas, nah, mm -hmm. I had the best mother and father ever. It was just all of those issues that came to light were issues that were in me that I subconsciously never dealt with. So... I was 35 years, oh, hold on, I like to say it like this. I was suicidal when I found out at 35 years old that I was adopted. So imagine all of that stuff. So the only thing that I knew, I didn't know about therapists and doctors and this place, this number, I didn't know about that. The only people that I thought could help me was a guy named Jack Daniels and yeah. another guy named Jim Bean and maybe his friend Johnny Walker could help me. So I went back to doing the very same thing that was killing me in the first place. Now, I did read that you were on drugs at once. once upon no, a I, ju I just, uh, no, uh, no, I wasn't never, I was an alcoholic. Okay. I sniffed, I, was... a, hold on, I sniffed a lot of cocaine. Though. Like everybody in the 80s sniffed cocaine. I okay. did, everybody did coke. That, that, that was, about, I even stopped coke. I just got tired of it. But I was, my thing was alcohol. Okay. I'm from I would say, um, all right, if I was drinking 40s all day, if I drink in a case of 40, I was drunk 24 hours a day. Then I, I had pancreatitis. I wasn't drunk no more. So then when I started drinking again, when I found out that I was ad adopted, I was drinking every second of the day. 
Okay. Just trying to get through with it. I never had a drug problem. I took a hit of crack one time. And I couldn't understand. I guess because your mind is, is funny. I took the cracker. I said, what's the big? I hate it. I hated the way it tastes. It didn't smell good. It didn't do nothing to me. My drug of choice is alcohol because it made me feel like the Hulk. Oh, okay. You know what I'm saying? But actually, um, when, I, when I eventually went to rehab, I was, um, I was using the alcohol to suppress my emotions. Okay. So I didn't have to deal with my true feelings. 